Good morning, everyone. Good having you here today. Um, I figured you're coming here to listen to me talk about streaming analytics in Azure. If not, the exit is right there. But I'm really happy you're all here with me today. And I'm hoping that you will find this useful for the next hour uh, and rewarding. Uh, I'll try to spend uh, at most half of this time to go through some theory and some use cases and things I want to show you about how this works. And then about half the time I want to spend on a demo instead, uh, just to kind of show you how it really works uh, in real time. Um, I have a Raspberry Pi with me, uh, just to show you how we stream IoT data um, straight to the cloud and out to different egress points. And if we have time, we'll also look at a Twitter use case. Uh, we'll see where we land at the end of this presentation. And if you have any questions during the presentation, uh, don't hesitate to stop uh, and ask. Uh, I'm more than happy to answer them in the end or uh, during the presentation. All right, so a little bit about me, myself. As you can hear, I am not from the US from the beginning. I am from Sweden, um, and I've been in DC for about three years um, with my wife. Uh, I run uh, .NET DC, uh, a, a meetup for uh, um, C Sharp .NET enthusiasts once a month. Uh, I love drinking beer, so you'll find me tonight drinking an IPA at the, at the pool for sure. I also like running, and I was out running at the beach uh, yesterday before, before going to the kickoff party. Uh, so that's what you find me doing. I work for a company called Excella. Uh, how many here have heard about Excella before? One. Perfect. He works there. <laughs> <laughs> so Excella is a, uh, it's a tech firm in DC, about 300 people. Uh, we serve the public uh, as well as the federal uh, sector. Uh, we have tons of great clients, tons of great employees. I really love working there. It's a great place to be, honestly. I've uh, been there for about a year. Um, and uh, they have just a lot of good culture and a lot of good things going for them. Uh, we're always hiring, and we have a national program as well. So if anyone is looking for work from Jacksonville at, or on the beach, uh, definitely sync up with me afterwards. That could be possible. All right, so uh, it's 9.30 in the morning. It's uh, later least than it's going to be in the, tomorrow for the first session, which is 8.30. Uh, but there's a few reasons why you want to stay awake today. Uh, the first one is, of course, why you're here, Stream Analytics. But one thing I wanted to point out directly is that Stream Analytics does not live by itself. Uh, it lives in an ecosystem in Azure, uh, and it, is, it's, uh, it relies on tons of other services to work and function properly. So we're going to cover Azure Event Subs, Azure Functions a bit, uh, Logic Apps, Cognitive Services, Twitter Streaming API, Power BI, uh, Raspberry Pi, and other things as well. Uh, I think we'll touch on Service Bus as well, um, and uh, some other cool stuff that you can do here. So just know that it's, uh, it's a cool service, but uh, it needs a lot of friends to do its work. All right. So let's start off uh, with real-time stream processing. What is it? Well, stream processing is all around you today. I think you, you notice it, and you think about it sometimes, and sometimes you don't think about it. Um, you know, GPS on your phone, Waze, those kind of stuff. There's obviously stream processing in some way, streaming your location all the time, streaming things that come to you and from you. Credit card fraud. I'm sure all of you have had your bank at some point uh, block your credit card for a potential fraudulent transaction. That is stream processing as well as at best. Um, tolls in DC is another good example where um, you drive through a toll station or drive through an automatic toll reader and it will get your license plate number, all those things, send you a bill if you don't have an easy pass or something like that. I come from a very uh, regulated industry. Uh, so my upbringing, or my upbringing, my, f my start of my career is in medical devices and pharma. So I used to work for GE Healthcare in Sweden, where we produced um, stem cell research, protein for, um, for the pharma industry, those kind of things. Every factory you can see has tons of stream processing in there to control all the systems, the pressure valves, the pumps, all those things. Um, and you have to make sure that if the pressure spike is coming, you want to shut down the equipment before it's too late. Um, and there's a lot of correlations here between different systems to make sure you make that decision. Another good example of that is breweries. You all probably like beer. They also have tons of these control systems, and they rely on stream processing to work. For those cases, most of the time, you want to look at something called Azure IoT Edge, which is stream analytics, but on-premise, or partial on-premise. So the latency between the cloud and the, the, the server uh, can be too long sometimes to kind of stop uh, a critical um, service or procedure you're doing. So depending on use case, you may want to look at Stream Analytics. Other times, you may want to look at IoT Edge. So just to frame the discussion a bit, when we talk about stream processing, what is a stream? 
Well, a stream, uh, in our context for our discussion today, is something that is continuous. It's very small in size, so we're talking kilobyte sizes. We're not streaming uh, videos or images, although we can. Um, it comes from multiple sources, has a timestamp, and has a value, or multiple values. If you're streaming things like uh, pictures uh, or, or video from a live feed on a toll system, we can do that. But we will put the picture and image in a blob storage in Azure instead, and then just have a reference to where that can be found in the actual information, in the event we're sending. Because we want to make sure it's as close to real time as possible with as little latency as possible. That's the two things we want to think about here. All right. So how does stream processing relate to something like batch processing? So batch processing is something that you come across every day. Um, ev even if you do like a financial report query, you do something on your SQL server or other server or database technology you're using, that's batch processing. You usually uh, query the whole data table, so large volumes. Um, it can take seconds, minutes, hours, days to run a query instead. Uh, so you don't get that real-time feedback. I used to work at uh, a company in Sweden, and we ran a 24-hour query in Oracle. Uh, once a week. And if that failed somewhere halfway through, you have to rerun it. And that was very tedious. But those things exist, and I'm sure you all have experience with doing something similar. Stream processing, on the hand, we're working with small volumes. So a window in time, a subset of data. So instead of a whole table, we're working on a time window or a temporal window. And we're going to look into what that really means later in this presentation. Uh, we want our latency to be as close as possible to real time, so milliseconds or seconds. Uh, if we go above that, we're going to have issues uh, with, um, with our decision making sometimes. All right, so apart from stream analytics, there are tons of other options out there, and I just want to frame that for you as well, as you know. Um, today we're going to talk about the one on the left here. Um, let's see if I have a pointer, actually. Look at that. Um, Azure Stream Analytics. But just in Azure, there's some other options as well. We have AD Insight with Spark Streaming. We have a patch, patch of Spark in the Azure Databricks. We have HD Insight with Storm, and some other options as well. How many here have touched Databricks or heard about it? OK, cool. Fantastic service, really great. Has tons of things built into it, like uh, you know, Jupyter Notebooks, doing machine learning, all those stuff. It's very expensive. It, just to get up a cluster going can be very expensive. Uh, so if you don't need all that machine learning as well and all the other things that comes with it, Stream Analytics is much cheaper and gets you off running quicker. So just think about your use case and what you want to do. Um, another thing here to think about as well is that uh, what kind of progr programming paradigm do you have here? So Azure Stream Analytics uses a flavor of SQL um, to do its queries, while other frameworks may use uh, Java, Scala, Python, or something else. So depending on what what uh, comfort level uh, your uh, company has with different uh, program solutions, you may want to choose one or another after that. Hope not in your way. <laughs> also, I want to note down here, I put Azure Functions and WebUSS here as well. You can do stream processing with Azure Functions and um, WebUSS as well. And especially Azure Functions is very useful. Uh, you just don't have the built-in query technology as you get in Azure Stream Analytics. All right. So a little GIF here just to show you some concept here that we're going to talk about. So Stream Analytics, center part here, um, and events here are the green ones, small events. So in general, anything that comes into the job is called ingress. Anything that comes out from the job is egress. Egress are actions we want to do based on the query that we run. Um, there can be tons of new things there. Ingress can come from a Raspberry Pi, IoT devices. It can come from a live API. Uh, it can come from a Twitter feed. You name it. Tons of options out there. There's tons of websites offering uh, good real-time data sources as well for you. So you have lots of things to choose from. The cool thing with this job is that you can integrate and call uh, Azure Machine Learning uh, Studio or service here straight from your job. So you can say that, OK, uh, for example, Twitter feed. Given that I have this tweet right now, um, the text right here, let's send it to a, a machine learning function and get the sentiment out of there. Or let's get the keywords out of there. And you can do it straight from the service itself. It currently only supports Azure Machine Learning Service as an output, so you can't call an Azure function to do the same thing, uh, just because it doesn't support reliability. But if you want to uh, build your own custom machine learning model in something called like ML.NET, so open source library, 
uh, you will actually be able to call that straight from the service in November, I've heard. Because uh, they will introduce something called Cloud Jobs, uh, which is uh, a way you can run C Sharp um, straight from the streaming analytics job as well. Another cool thing here is that you can define user defined functions in JavaScript to do stuff that you want to do in a job. So if you want to convert dates, you want to convert um, other data in some format you want, you can write JavaScript and you can call that from SQL. So it's, it's kind of funny. Like you can call JavaScript from SQL. I still can't really wrap my head around that, but I think it's really cool. All right. Questions so far? Good pace? OK. Stop me otherwise. All right. So this is my favorite part. We're going to play Jeopardy. So ingress, so inputs to the streaming job. There's tons of them. There's four right now. Can anyone name all four of them? The second one is a free one. <laughs> so which one is the first one? Azure Blob. Yep. Uh, SQL Server. Event Hub. Yep. And this last one? IoT Hub. OK. So IoT Hub and Event Hub are very similar in the use cases. And you can most of the time use both um, and as replaceable versions of it. But the difference between IoT Hub and Event Hub is that Event Hub only has one directional communication. It goes from the source to the job, while IoT Hub has a bi-directional communication. So if you want to, for example, change the frequency of data coming in to your job, uh, you can use an IoT Hub and uh, call back to your calling device and say, hey, it's going a little bit too fast right now. I don't need so much data. Kind of cool down a bit. That's good, for example, if you're monitoring wind strengths uh, and before a storm. And before a storm, you only care about once a minute updates because it's pretty calm and easy. When a storm picks up, you want to have better frequency, better resolution, so you may want to increase that. So IoT and Event Hub are used for real-time streams, so streams of real-time data. Blob storage on a SQL Server are used for reference data. And reference data are things that you can do to enrich your stream. So going back to the toll example, because I think that's just very applicable, if someone takes a picture of your license plate, that may not be enough information for them to send a bill to you because they don't know where you live. So they can send your license plate number uh, or your make of your car or whatever through the event, hub, uh, event stream. But then based on that, you can join on reference data to get your VIN number, to get your billing information, because that's data that is stagnant. That won't change. You know, very slow moving data. So any slow moving data you have um, can be used for that. So for example, my uh, Raspberry Pi that I'm going to use later today, it has a serial number, very boring. I can't display that in, uh, you know, in graphs or anything like that because no one knows whose Raspberry Pi it is. But I can enrich that and join on a reference stream to get Alexander's Raspberry Pi. So you get tons of good examples of that. All right, egress. That's really where uh, this thing shines. There's so many options of things you can do here. So does anyone want to try uh, all of these? Power BI, Table storage, service bus, and data lake. Yes. So you can actually, uh, based on your output of your job, you can call an Azure function to send an email. You can put a message in a service bus queue that gets picked up later by Logic App to call someone through Trillo or do some other integration things. You can just dump all your data in Cosmos DB for later processing if you want to, or a data lake. There's just so many options here. So when you start thinking about what you can do here, uh, you'll see all the possibilities here and how you can kind of keep funneling this into an other streaming job or an other uh, business process of your choosing. All right, so temporal windows. I spoke about the fact that we don't query a table when we do this thing. We query a, time, um, a window in the time, right? There are three ways you can do that. Uh, the first one is going to be tumbling window. Um, so tumbling window means that we have equal length windows and they're non-overlapping. So we can say, for example, that our tumbling window is going to be 10 seconds. So um, we, for example, if, it, if we have a Twitter feed, for example, um, and we want to know how many tweets um, we have for a certain time period, we can do a tumble window and say, OK, how many tweets did I have in the last 10 seconds? The thing with this is that if you do a, a tumbling window, you only get an output every 10 seconds as well. You won't get an output quicker than that. So your, your, buffer, your stream will be buffered 10 seconds, more or less. Useful, useful in many cases. My favorite is hopping windows. Hopping windows is also equal length, but they're overlapping. All right? 
So you can set 10 seconds, so average uh, number of, of tweets or the sentiment score for the last 10 seconds, but hop and give me a new window every five seconds. This will mean that you'll get a new window and you get output from the job every five seconds, depending on what you set your hop to. And you can see the SQL for it right here. Um, so that would be, you group, you group your data, oh, sorry. You group your data by hopping window. You set the duration, so it's one minute here. And you set how quick it should hop here. A couple of things to note on hopping window is that one event, number three for example, can be in multiple windows. So you get more of like an averaging effect here instead of having the strict kind of zigzag I guess you can get from a tumbling window. Make sense? So depending on the use case you have, you may choose one window over the other. You can try different things. The last one, there's actually one more, but I will skip that today. The last one I'm going to talk about today is sliding window. So sliding window is, uh, is a little bit different. They have equal length, but they're very random when they appear. So they're very, very useful when you don't have so much data, you have very stagnant data flow for a while, and then suddenly you get a peak, and you want very high resolution of the peak. So you can tell it to only output things if this condition is met. Uh, so if I have uh, more than 10 tweets about a certain topic, then start doing some windows. Otherwise, don't bother, because I don't really care about it. It's very useful when you have peaks, and you really want to look at the peaks and how they, uh, what kind of resolution they have and things to do. All right, so those are temporal windows. Does everyone feel like they can understand the difference between temporal windows and, and querying a table? So when you query your data again, you select your temporal window and you query based on that. That's kind of your frame of reference. That can be long, that can be short, depends on use case. Things to think about here. If your temporal window is long, that will mean that you keep all things in memory. That means that your job is expensive, all right? Because you pay for CPU, memory, and uh, uh, something else, through, throughput, I think. And uh, depending on your length of your windows, your query complexity, those kind of stuff, you will incur more cost. So, but sometimes it's useful to do it. But just be cautious when you do this that you want to be cognizant of your cost as well. All right. So how does temporal SQL look like? It's a really cool world, a cool word, uh, temporal SQL. It's pretty boring. It looks exactly like normal SQL, more or less, with a few caveats here. Um, and that is the fact that you select star into an output from something, and you group by a tumbling window. So normal SQL, you just select star from a table, or you select whatever you want from a table, you're good. You have to define where you're piping it to here. So that could be an Azure function, that could be a service topic, all kinds of stuff. You don't need to group it by a tumbling window or a window. You can actually just uh, fund your data straight through if you want to and just project and select what you want from the stream. Uh, this is up to you, um, depending on what you want to do. There are tons of built-in functions in Azure Stream Analytics uh, that you can do and use for your purpose. So um, lag, for example, is a super useful function. Lag allows you to compare your current event with an event previous in time of your choosing. So for example, the Raspberry Pi here, we're going to see that later, it, it looks at the distance uh, of an object from where it is right now. And you can use a lag function to detect if someone has come closer to the Raspberry Pi in the last 10 seconds or not. And someone, if someone has come closer or a motion has been detected, uh, you can output that to an Azure function. So it's kind of like a burglar alarm, like a motion sensor, right? Um, you can do it with one line change only. It's a lag function. Really cool stuff. Uh, it's first, first, it's exactly what it looks like. It's just getting the first event in your time window. Um, it's last, it's getting the last event in your time window. So if you're looking at speeding cameras, you can get, okay, who speeded first in this time window? Who speeded last? What is the, um, I guess, top speed? Another thing that's built in as of recently is anomaly detection. So uh, this one is powered by the open source library ML.net, and it allows you to define your sensitivity but then you can say, OK, uh, go keep monitoring for anomalies here. So um, if you're streaming stock data, for example, uh, and you want to see that, or Bitcoin data, whatever you want to stream, you can set it to see how sensitive it will be and see, OK, now it starts dropping too much for my sensitivity. And I can output, like, start selling stock or start um, buying Bitcoin, whatever you want to do here. But it's out of the box machine learning model that you can just start using in SQL directly. So cool stuff. 
If you do a lot of uh, geospatial things, there are also things here to get distance between two data points, those kind of stuff here. Uh, a little bit more query intense, uh, but you can do it out of the box here. So I suggest you look at these uh, at some point, because I think they provide a lot of insight and information. All right, last points before we go into demoing. It's going to be uh, talking a bit about scaling and pricing and performance. So I mentioned before that uh, this is a lot cheaper than uh, Databricks. So Databricks, if you want to get up and running with that uh, for something reasonable, reasonable load, we're talking about, about $8 an hour in cost. Streaming Analytics instead uh, starts at 11 cents an hour for like a very low performing job and goes up from there. You pay per streaming unit. And a streaming unit, as, much, uh, as a lot of other things in Azure, is a combination between CPU, memory, and storage. So depending on your query complexity, depending on your throughput of data, all the stuff, you will incur more streaming units. Uh, starting off with one is just fine. You can have 192 streaming units per job as of now. They just bumped it up from MS Build 2019. Um, I think from what I heard, you can call Microsoft. You need more than that as well. Uh, so you can probably increase that. But with that said, it can, it can take a heavy load of data but Databricks can take an even heavier load. So if you really need like gigabyte, gigabyte throughput, and if you can't like scale in multiple jobs, you may want to consider something like Databricks instead. Um, but a really cool thing you can do as well is you can partition your workload into multiple streams or in multiple calculations. Um, so like event tabs here. How many are familiar with event tabs? A few? Great. So you can do partitions in event tabs, right? So you can have multiple readers. You can have 32, I think, per event tab. I think two is a default. That means you can have two readers that listen to events at the same time and put them out to, to listeners. You can at the same time put uh, queries in parallel here. So you can have 32 partitions in your job as well. So for example, let's say I have, uh, I'm doing a query about um, IoT data, right? And I am grouping it by device, because I only care about the average temperature on each device. I don't care about anything cross-related between those two. We can then partition our query by device ID, just like this example here, and we can run them in parallel in different partitions. That's super useful if you want to keep your performance up and you don't want to slow things down. One thing to note, though, is your partitions is set when you create a job. You can't change that after you've done a job. If you want to change that, you have to create a new job. Very tedious. So think about uh, your uh, parallel I guess, strategy a bit before you endeavor too much in this. Um, creating a new job is not too bad, uh, but it's a little bit tedious to set up the inputs and out outputs if you have a lot of those, so think about that. All right, 25 minutes in and we have the demo. It's good. Everyone awake still? One's awake, good. So questions on that so far? Yes? Say we have the State of the Union address, right? and you want to run some real-time analytics for one hour. Okay. Right? So you create a model, create a job, and you're doing analytics on that one hour. That hour has passed. Let's say you, you want to use the same hour, and you want to run different models on it. What next? It's not real-time anymore. So is it storing the data for that hour? You can output into the Cosmos DB if you want to, or a SQL Server, or a data lake for later processing if you want to. So that's, yeah, you can do that for later as well, definitely. That's a good question. In many cases you want to because you want to go back and maybe retrain a, a machine learning model or something else based on that data, so. All right, so we're gonna jump into the first demo uh, that I think we'll spend some time on, uh, which is gonna be a Raspberry Pi IoT data demo. So on stage here, I have my Raspberry Pi. And I can barely lift it up, here you go. Uh, it's my travel companion. It's getting a bit beat up here, but I love it. So it has a couple sensors, very basic stuff. Temperature, humidity, light, sound, proximity sensors. It all feeds into the Raspberry Pi, and it's uh, running a very simple Python script um, and uh, pushing that to event tabs in Azure. The event tab is uh, just piping it straight through to Azure Stream Analytics as an input. So this is our ingress. And we're joining our stream here on reference data in Azure Blob Storage, which provides me with the name of the, um, the device here. Based on the query result, we're gonna output this straight to Power BI dashboard to see in real time what the temperature's in here. And right now it's pretty cold, 
So I think it'd be cool. Uh, and we also uh, look at uh, dumping the data um, into service bus uh, message queue uh, that will be picked up by Logic App and send me an email. And it will do that if someone go, comes closer to my Raspberry Pi or if I have like a motion detection. So we'll look at how we can kind of create your own burglar arm if you want to, All right? So to get started here, I want to just show you this and I'll, um, actually let me do this first. Let's see. So the first thing I want to show you is, this is the um, script that's running on the Raspberry Pi. Let's see if I can zoom in, probably not. Okay, that's fine. It's in Python, nothing special. It's using open source packages to integrate with Azure. Um, but what it's doing, it's reading, uh, using Groove Pi, which is like a thing you put on the Raspberry Pi here for the firmware. And it's reading my sensor data. And it's looping over uh, a loop here. And every second, it's sending me data about my, um, my light level, my sound level, my temperature, humidity, all those stuff. And I'm just pushing it to Azure. Nothing special at all. If you plug in the Raspberry Pi, we can start that uh, script and see how it's running. And if it's awake, all right. So we have a command prompt, all good. It's already in the folder for this. And we'll kick off the job to do this. And hopefully that will work, let's see. All right, so you can see here, uh, at least for those sitting close by, it is every second it's pushing out things about what we're reading here. So this is going to be in JSON format. It's pushing a device ID, and as you can see, it's pretty useless. It doesn't tell me anything about who it's coming from. It's pushing out uh, an, a JSON object here, sensor readings, with distance, sound level, light level, temperature, humidity, uh, and so forth. Uh, I am from Sweden, so I prefer my temperature in Celsius. 70 degrees is very cold. It's like, seven, it's like 65, maybe? Something like that. Um, well, it went up here, close to the projector. So that's all good. So it's pushing this in event pub right now, every second. So if we plug this in again, we can look at the portal and see if we have any data coming through, right? And we open up the portal here. We will look at, actually I'll start that. So in Azure, uh, we talked about the fact that we have an event tab that's listening to this. So I do have one right here, uh, and this is the one I'm looking at. It will take a little while for this data to come through, but um, you do have um, a spike earlier today that we've seen as well. While we wait for that, we'll look at something else here. Um, as of MS Build 2019, they built a really cool functionality on event hubs, which includes Stream Analytics. If you look at capture events here, sorry, if we can find it. Dun, 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 process data. So it allows you actually to do, um, to, to query your event hub stream with Stream Analytics, um, just straight off. So you don't actually need to even go into Stream Analytics anymore. You can actually go straight to your event hub and you can write your queries to see what data you have currently going through your Kafka instance here. So I'm not gonna do it right now, but I just wanna show you that it's a new functionality you can do. It's very useful if you just wanna see, because sometimes the event type is a black box. You don't necessarily know what comes in there and out there. This allows you to do that without provisioning a stream jobbing. So cool stuff. So let's go back to the event hub and see if we have any data. Okay, we got a spike here. Cool. So we have data coming in. I'm looking at this one. All right, cool. So before we go in and look at the streaming job in, in Azure in the portal, I want to show you how you can build these jobs in, in Visual Studio. All right. So there's actually tooling available in Visual Studio. And if you create a new uh, project here, there's a template for this. Uh, Azure Stream Analytics. So there's tons of uh, templates here available for you to choose. If you choose the uh, Azure Stream Analytics application, you will have some bootstrapping up here so you get the most important things. Note that you also have the uh, IoT Edge version as well. If you want to do it on-premise instead, you can do that as well. I think IoT Edge is actually ahead of Stream Analytics. You can do much more stuff with that than you can do in Stream Analytics. Um, so if you want to go on like a, the cutting edge, look at that. 
So we create one of those solutions. This is fine. I want to show you how you plug into your event hub and get your data locally. So if we zoom in here a bit. So it's a little bit hard to read on the right. I can't zoom that in, unfortunately. But to the right here, we have a couple of things. We have functions, uh, inputs, outputs, and a script. The script is whatever we want to write here. It's going to be the select statement that we want to run through. And the input is where we want to choose um, what to read from. So if you double click on the input, which is going to be a JSON describing where your data is coming from, you'll be able to choose your um, Azure subscription, and you'll be able to navigate through that to get your event hub and pick that as an input or an ingress. So for me, for example, I've got a few, but I think it's going to reside here, and probably here, and here. So cool stuff. So if we go and do select star here, we want to select everything just to kind of look at the stream and see what it looks like. We can do that into output, which is going to be just a global uh, local output uh, in Studio from our input. And right now, I named it input. That was the default name. You can change that to whatever you want to. It doesn't matter. But if you decide to run that locally, we're going to get, uh, OK, sorry. If you run it locally, you also need to change here. Use cloud input. Otherwise, we'll try something else. And let's do this. So it's going to start a local run. And hopefully, we'll get some data here at the bottom here, if this works as expected. All right, good. So it's hard to see, but we have device ID. We have a JSON object here with sensor readings, which has all the distance sound level, the event processing time, and partition ID, all those kind of stuff. So we're getting data through. So it's a good sign. But the, the, we can't really work with that JSON structure, right? It's an JSON object. We have the distance. We have the properties. What if we really wanted to get uh, those things straight out? So we have distance as a scalar object and temperature as well. Well, let's look at that. If we stop this job here, Control C, close that. We can actually decide what we want to do here. And just and this is something I think is really cool here. Uh, just as you work with uh, C sharp or anything else, you can actually navigate the properties with just dot. So we know that um, the object that's coming through is called sensor readings. And we get intelligence there as well, based on my stream input. So we say, OK, I want to look at distance. I want to look at uh, temperature, for example. Let's start with those. And maybe I want my device ID as well, actually. So device ID, OK? But I also want to know when the time of the event is. By default, uh, we will get a time from the stream, as you saw, in queue time. But there's two kinds of times you want to use here. Depending on your use case, you can choose one over the other. You have the application time, which is when the event was produced. So I could set that on my Raspberry Pi saying, this is the time I read this reading and send with me, and I will use that. Or I can have time of arrival, which is when it came to me in the stream manager's job. I will just use time of arri arrival right now, which is going to be system timestamp. Um, but depending on your application, you may have different things there. Because we have something called um, out-of-order policies, uh, which allows you to define how you want to handle out-of-order events. So let's say you have a, an application on your phone, for example, right? You go in a tunnel, and it's streaming data. You can't stream data in a tunnel. It will black out. But you probably queue up the data, and when you get out of the tunnel, it will start sending to the cloud again. So how should a job handle that data that's not in order anymore? Should it wait? Should it do something? Well, that's up to you to decide. You can either buffer the stream for like 10 seconds or 20 seconds and wait for the data, or you can discard it and don't care about it. But you have to think about that for your stream, because depending on what you do, you have different use cases. All right. So let's try to run this and get the data out. And we'll see. All right. So we have projected the data now all the way down here. We have arrival time, we have device ID, we have distance, we have temperature. So just a simple dot for the property, we'll get everything out very quickly. And we can keep going and doing stuff here really well as well. So we can actually go ahead and uh, let's see. We can actually start using average functions and other things as well here. 
So we can do, just like in SQL, we can use average, <laughs> turn off Slack, but that doesn't really matter apparently. Sorry for that. All right, so you can do average temperature, um, just like in normal SQL, nothing special at all. But when you start doing average, what do you need to do? Group by, exactly. So we need to group some from here. So let's start looking at temple windows. We can group by, uh, let's do my favorite, hopping window. So what are the things you need to define in a hopping window? A tumbling window that was just like a same window size and they were not overlapping. Yep, exactly. And they're called exactly that, so duration. So how long do you want the duration to be here? How long do you want to average the time, time and temperature here? Five seconds. OK. So you'll define uh, the, the measurement here, so second, the five. How often do you want to hop here? Every second? Sure. All right. So every second. So that's how easy you define a hopping window. So now we're saying we want to output every second, but we want to average the temperature for a lot and a distance for the last five seconds. OK? So let's do that, let's see how that works. All right, and you can't group by device ID. So that doesn't work. And I think that should be good. Let's try it again. Ah, all right. Also, if you do average, you need to name it new property name. You can't do the same, so average distance as average temp. All right. But at least you get a lot of intelligence here, which is very useful when you run this. And doing this allows you not to have to like go into the job and start it every time with your query. You can just try it out here instead. Because the setting up the stream and its job, it takes like a minute or two to start it. Because it needs to provision its instances, and you set it up, start it, all those kind of stuff. Uh, so it's very tedious if you want to test your query live in Azure. This is much more quicker. All right. So we see it on here now, and it's very hard. Take my word for it. But every second, we get an output now. Because that's what we do. We hop every second. And we get an average temperature, which is 17 degrees Celsius, and average distance of six centimeters. Not inches, not yards. Oh, sorry. We should have that. I'm, I'm, um, we're doing a built-in uh, bookshelf for my wife, and we're trying to measure things for a designer. And it's in yards, and you have to be like, oh, what's half of 132 inches and a three-fourths? It's just difficult. Anyway, so you get all this cool insight here. So this is very useful to get started and just kind of play around with this thing. Whatever you want to do here, you can do. So, all right. So enough about Studio. Let's take a look at how it looks in Azure, right? Because that's, that's why you're here. So in Azure, this is what you will see. And I'll try to zoom in a little bit here so we'll see. Better resolution. All right, I think that is fine. Maybe I won. Can you see well here? Is it good? OK. So a couple of things to note here. We have inputs. We have functions. We have query. We have outputs. Um, and we start it here, and we'll do those things. So inputs, you have to define your inputs here, like anything else. Uh, for our, our purposes here, we have an event tab coming in, as we said, and reference data from blob storage. It's very simple to define this. You can just find your event tab, say, this is my event tab. The only thing you need to think about here is how you have to define your uh, format. This could be JSON. It could be uh, comma separated files. It can be Avro. And they actually even added this one right now, because I haven't seen that before. So tons of options to choose, depending on your structure here. Same thing for the blob storage. Just define that. The only thing here is that you have to define which container we have uh, your data in and how it looks like. In our case, it's going to be a flat file, just to reference the data of JSON. And it's going to look like uh, this, which is just a simple JSON file with my device ID and my device name. But you can define a pattern. You can define a thing so your data is slow changing every day, right? So you can define a date pattern. So every day, the date's going to change, and it's going to increment that as well. So those things are pretty useful if you have like slow changing data. So you maybe want an update on the uh, VIN numbers every day because you have car registration coming in or whatever, but you don't want to do it every day or every second or so. Outputs, 
we will push things here to Power BI. Uh, and if you do Power BI, how many here use Power BI? OK, a couple. Power BI is like Tableau um, or other like business intelligence tools. It's a Microsoft version. It's very affordable. It has something called a streaming API or a streaming data set. So when you do this, you log in as your Power BI user, and you define what your data set name should be, and you start like pushing data. And when you start pushing data, it's going to create a data set, data set for you. And you can start querying that, putting tiles and dashboards on there, and all the things like that. So we'll look at that in just a bit. But it's very useful if you just dump your data in real time to see what you want to see here. Uh, for our purposes here today, we're going to trigger a service best topic as well. Uh, we're going to put a message in there that's going to get picked up by an Azure Logic app, which is going to send me an email that, hey, someone is in my house. So if you haven't looked at Logic apps yet, look at Logic apps. Fantastic. It's like a glue application that takes different inputs and then outputs and then has logic in between. It's so useful. I used to have uh, like custom written C sharp code here to glue things together sometimes or read things from Twitter. I don't need it anymore. Logic app makes it just very easy to avoid those things. All right. I may have a function. OK, good. I have a function. Great. Wasn't sure. So I created a JavaScript function here um, just for like, purposes of this demonstration here. Um, because I'm from Sweden, and in the US we have Fahrenheit, we may want to see things in Fahrenheit. right? So we can have a conversion function that just does that and just um, takes the Celsius input and outputs Fahrenheit for the dashboard. So you can do those kind of things. And this is a very simple example of what you can do. But just imagine those kind of stuff here. Like you want some conversion functions, uh, and you, have no, you may not have um, ownership of your input or your event sources. So you can't change how they output things for you. All right. Cool. All right. Let me get let start the job if, if, as I talk, because it will take a while. So let's look at the query before we look at the outputs here. So the query is similar to what we wrote before. It is going to project all the properties on the data. It's going to join on my reference input here. It's going to join on my JSON file by device ID. And that's the way I'm going to get ref device name here. It's going to be my Power BI dashboard. You can also join real-time streams together, which is really cool. But you need to have some uh, uh, time window joining then. And it gets a little bit complicated, but you can. You can also use uh, uh, um, a lot of other SQL things, like the width um, statement, those kind of stuff, to do subqueries. So that's very useful. Uh, for the service bus queue, uh, remember I spoke about lag before? All right, so we're using lag right here. This is where we're saying, OK, um, get my distance from my event. And let's compare the distance here. Let's say, OK, is my distance right now, is that smaller than my distance 10 seconds ago? It's to the right here. So that's using a one line thing here and say, OK, well, let's compare lag on distance over and partition over device ID and then 10 seconds ago. And if it's smaller, trigger an event that put a topic into my service bus queue. Good. Uh, and just for full transparency, the service bus queue is going to put a message, uh, it's going to be picked up here by a logic app. So the logic app is listening on messages on my motion detection service bus queue here. Every second, it's going to look for a new message. If it finds a new message, it's going to send me an email on my, uh, yeah on my um, email here, so demo email. And we'll put a subject in there. You can, put, uh, you can pipe through the body here as well. So content is the body. So that's going to be the JSON. So the same things. It's very simple. So you see how easy it is to send an email here, just putting that into the queue. Um, before, you can do an Azure function for this if you want to, which is very useful. Uh, definitely worth doing for many, many scenarios. But if you're sending emails or like calling through Twilio, because you can do Twilio as well here, um, you don't necessarily need to do that through an Azure function or anything else custom. You can do it here. So, all right. So let's see if the job started. Is it running or not? I think, see, it's still starting. So this is why you want to do your, uh, your querying and all things locally, because otherwise you don't know. Uh, you have to start and stop it all the time. And when I, when I started doing this, it took me forever to uh, start the jobs, and they failed for no reason whatsoever. Uh, and it, the error log was very difficult to read. 
they have done a, a lot of good jobs there right now so far, and you can get the nice like, activity log and all those stuff. All right. It should start in a few seconds, but let's look at this while we do that. So event ordering. I spoke about that briefly. This is where you will set up your events arrive late and how you want to do here. For example, you can choose to adjust your stream and incorporate those in your buffer, or you can drop them. And you can define how long you want to wait for your events to come in as well. But remember, if you do this, you will buffer your stream. If you set it to 10 seconds, it will wait 10 seconds all the time to make sure to have all the events that it wants to get, right? So just be careful when you use this, uh, depending on your use case. All right. Wow. Four minutes ago, starting it. Let's see. All right, while that's starting, do you have any questions so far? Good. How many here would uh, potentially use this in their business as of now? I see use cases. Okay, one. Good. Cool. So I'm currently working on an application to do. F oh, starting. Okay, good. I won't say that. Then. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So let's look at this. I have a Power BI dashboard here uh, that I set up. And let's see if we get output here. Let's refresh that. All right. We have data. Cool. So this is Power BI, for those who haven't seen it before. It's just simple tiles, nothing special. But now we're having a streaming data set here. We can see the temperature, humidity, light level, sound, distance. Uh, and we can see the data coming through here. Closest object, all those things. And it's outputting, I think, every five seconds or so right now. Uh, or actually, all the time, actually. There's no grouping here. This is super simple to set up. When you define your workspace to go through, you will create a streaming data set. If you want to add a new tile, it's very simple. You go here, and you have custom streaming data in the corner right here. This is where your data set is going to come to. You click Next here. You can choose which data set you want. So I currently have three streaming data sets in my account here. The one we're currently looking at and listening to is a Raspberry Pi uh, data set right here. You click Next here. You can choose what kind of card you want. Cards are these ones here. Line chart are these ones here. Uh, uh, this one is going to be, uh, how do you pronounce that? Gauge? Gauge. Gauge, yes, gauge. It's going to be that kind of thing uh, that you have. If you choose a card, you can add value. You can only choose things that come with your event. So right now, we're currently having temperature, distance, and all those things going through. If there's anything else <coughs> that you want to choose, you have to first change your query. If you change your query and output things, you're going to break this. You may have to redo some of these bindings here, just so you know. So it's a little bit sensitive um, to what the query in includes. So kind of wait with your dashboard for the final state until you kind of uh, solidify the contract that you're sending through. Just a recommendation. Uh, so uh, you define, I'll show you that real quick. You define which workspace to output from. So outputs, see if I can do it when it's running. But So you see right here that I have said that push this to my streaming analytics workspace, call it Raspberry Pi dataset, and stream. And so I am currently in that workspace right here. You went to, okay. Yeah. To get data. Exactly. So it's going to create the dataset for me. So I don't create it for myself. They create it for me when I push data. Does that answer your question? Yeah. OK. All right. So lastly, I want to show you the service bus topic. <clears throat> so right now, we have two centimeters, right? Uh, that's closest object. We have currently no emails in my inbox. Have you ever seen that kind of clean inbox? <laughs> I wish that was my work email. It's not. Or my private email. All right. But what happens if we change the closest object here, or just change in general? Um, so we have two centimeters right here right now. Actually, let me, so here's the motion sensor. Let me turn it up and point it to someone. Three centimeters, 518 centimeters to closest one. And if I turn it down again, <coughs> you have a difference here. So you see that you get this real-time feedback here when I turn things over. If I put that down, you can see that my mailbox is getting swamped now. Because every time I change it around, we had a motion change as well. So you can make it smarter and like wait a little bit, because someone's already been there. This is very rudimentary and <coughs> stupid. But you see how that uh, service bus topic got put in the queue. Logic app picked it up. I piped it through to my Outlook. And if we look at this, 
we're going to get, uh, oh, it's hard to read. Well, <coughs> we're going to get the, the JSON object here that we want to put out. So three centimeters was the closest one here. That was in the end. 31 centimeters right there, those things. So you can pipe through things from the event here as well. And you can build things you want to do here very useful, very easy. <coughs> cool. All right. So I have another demo, but I think I'll stop there because it's uh, nine minutes left, and I don't want to take the other speaker's time. So I'll have questions instead. Yeah. What about in this particular case, like aggregation? Like if I had more than, more than just the one uh, device <coughs> in here, and I wanted to see maybe the average temperature over. Yeah, you, know, you can do that for sure. Because you, you, all the data that comes in, again, it's going to be a temporal window, no matter which device is coming from. So all the devices will go to the same input and same ingress, and you can just uh, query average temperature across all devices. You don't need to put your group by device ID or partition by device ID in that case. So yep, definitely possible. Is there a video limitation? Like, if, what if you have like millions, millions of records? So, good question. Streaming units. Uh, there's no, I think, necessarily data limitation, but you're going to hit the streaming units limits at some point. Because remember, that's CPU, memory, and storage. And depending how long your query is, how much data you have in your time window, it's going to take up memory. So that will increase the <laughs> streaming units you have. And 192 is the limit, so at some point you'll hit that. Can you change the length of temporal window depending on the incoming traffic? Ooh, good question. I don't know. There's one more temple window I didn't go through today that is pretty recent. Look that up and see if that can help. I know that's a very specific window. So it may address that, but I don't think you can. Yeah. In order to get that kind of streaming data to Power BI, do you have to get a subscription level? Or is that the free tier that we're looking at right now? For Azure or? For Power BI. Um, that's, I think, so I have a pro, level, pro account. Pro level, okay. So, but I'm pretty sure you can get it from a free account. Um, I need to check that. I would be surprised if you can't, honestly. Um, but usually Power BI Pro is like $10 a month or something. So it's reasonable, but of course, I definitely try it out. And I'm happy to help you afterwards if you want to set it up. Uh, other questions? All right. All right. In that case, thank you all so much for coming. I enjoyed having you here. Thank you guys.